As we continue to look at liquids and solids in this unit, we're going to consider phase changes next. In particular, we'll look at the process of vaporization. Vaporization refers to the change in state from a liquid to a gas. Boiling is our common reference point for this phase change. However, vaporization can occur well below the boiling point of a liquid. Consider a puddle of water on a dry day. Over time, the puddle disappears, and this is because the water evaporates. This occurs even though the air temperature is well below the boiling point of water. So how does this happen? It turns out that the molecules of water inside the puddle are in constant random motion. There's a great quote from Roald Hoffman, Nobel laureate in chemistry, that describes this process. And as he puts it, it's a wild dance floor there at the molecular level. So the average kinetic energy of the molecules is proportional to temperature. The warmer the water, the greater the average kinetic energy. And it's important to remember that this is just an average though. At any one temperature, some of the molecules of water in the puddle will be moving with more energy than average, while some will be, will be moving with less. And this graphic actually shows the typical distribution in kinetic or thermal energy for water molecules at two different temperatures. The peak in each curve corresponds to that average kinetic energy. The dashed vertical line indicates the minimum energy needed for a molecule to escape from the intermolecular forces that hold it in liquid form so that it can become a gas molecule. And even at the lower temperatures represented by this brownish red curve, a small fraction of the molecules have a high enough kinetic energy to escape. As the temperature increases, that fraction of molecules with enough escape energy actually increases, as we can see with the black curve. So the higher the temperature, the more molecules that break free and enter the gas phase. Now the amount of escape energy needed to go into the gas phase depends on the strength of the intermolecular attractions in the liquid. In general, the weaker the attractions, the less energy necessary to escape the liquid phase. So the minimum energy needed for one mole of liquid molecules to break free of their intermolecular attractions and become gas molecules is known as the enthalpy of vaporization, or delta HVAP. Now this table shows several common liquids, their boiling points, as well as their enthalpy of vaporizations. The first two entries, water and rubbing alcohol, are both molecules that exhibit hydrogen bonding as their strongest intermolecular, intermolecular force. They have higher boiling points, and we can also see that these stronger intermolecular forces result in higher enthalpy of vaporizations. In contrast, acetone and diethyl ether exhibit dipole-dipole interactions as their strongest intermolecular force. So both of these molecules are polar, but they don't contain hydrogen directly bound to the oxygen atom. Slightly weaker intermolecular interactions result in lower boiling points than the hydrogen bonding compounds, as well as lower enthalpy of vaporizations. It's important to note that enthalpy of vaporization is slightly temperature dependent. There are two columns here for delta HVAP one at boiling point and one at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. The enthalpies at room temperature are slightly higher because the liquids contain less thermal energy. So they need just a little bit more energy, the molecules at that point, to actually break free from the surface.
There's one other major factor that can influence the number of liquid molecules that can escape into the gas phase. Have you ever noticed that sweat takes much longer to dry on a humid day than it does on a dry day? This is because humid air already has a significant amount of water vapor in it. Let's look at this in a little more depth. So imagine a sealed flask of water. In this drawing, we have a round flask that's attached to a pressure gauge and a U-tube manometer that contains mercury to seal it. Now both the pressure gauge and the manometer can be used to uh, measure the change in pressure that happens as the water evaporates. We'll assume that initially the air above the water is completely dry and all the water molecules are in the liquid phase. This is represented in drawing A. As time progresses, some of those water molecules will have enough energy to escape from the surface of the liquid and enter the gas phase. So the water starts to evaporate. And in drawing B, we see these gas molecules in red above the surface of the liquid. We also see that the pressure reading on the gauge has actually increased as a result of these additional gas phase molecules. Once in the vapor phase, some of these molecules will lose energy through molecular collisions, and they may even lose enough energy to start condensing back into the liquid phase, either at the surface of the liquid or as droplets on the surrounding surfaces. Now this process, condensation, is the opposite of vaporization. Because there are only a small number of molecules in the vapor phase at this point, though, the rate of evaporation is still faster than condensation. So the amount of water molecules in the vapor phase actually continues to increase, and the pressure continues to rise. As more water molecules enter the vapor phase, though, the rate of condensation will ultimately increase. And eventually, evaporation and condensation reach the same speed, and the air in the flask is said to be saturated with water vapor. The amount of gas phase molecules, then, no longer increases. This is a steady state condition known as dynamic equilibrium, and it's represented in drawing C. It's important to note that evaporation and condensation are both still occurring at the steady state. Because these opposing processes are occurring at the same rate, however, the relative amounts of gas and liquid are no longer changing. So for every molecule that evaporates, another one condenses back into the liquid phase. And this means that the pressure in the flask then is no longer changing. The difference between this new stable pressure and the pressure before the liquid started evaporating is known as the vapor pressure of that liquid. So the formal definition of vapor pressure is the partial pressure exerted by the gas phase of a molecule in a closed container when it is in dynamic equilibrium with its liquid. And the term dynamic equilibrium refers to a state of balance between two opposing processes, like condensation and evaporation. Now this state of balance occurs when the two processes are occurring at the same rate. So every time a water molecule evaporates from the liquid phase, a gas phase water molecule condenses back. It results in a steady state concentration of reactants and products. Vapor pressure is simply a measure of the steady state concentration of gas molecules at equilibrium. So the vapor pressure of any liquid varies with the strength of intramolecular forces present in the liquid phase and with the temperature. 
We can see these relationships in the vapor pressure curves presented on this graph. So temperature is on the x-axis, while vapor pressure in units of kilopascals is on the y-axis. And there are four curves here representing four different liquids. Ethyl ether actually experiences the weakest of the intermolecular attractions for the liquids represented here. So it, its strongest intermolecular forces are dipole-dipole interactions. The other liquids present, ethyl alcohol, water, and ethylene glycol, all have hydrogen bonding as their strongest intermolecular forces. Now we can see the effect of intermolecular force strength on the position of these curves and the relationship between vapor pressure and temperature. So ethyl ether generally has higher vapor pressures at lower temperatures than the other liquids. In other words, it's a little easier for ethyl ether molecules to escape into the gas phase at lower temperatures because they're held together a little less strongly. The hydrogen bonding interactions within the remaining liquids are actually strongest in ethylene glycol, which contains two hydroxyl groups, two OH groups. Ethyl alcohol, in contrast, is a similar size molecule, but it contains only one OH group. Its weaker hydrogen bonding interactions are seen in the fact that it has higher vapor pressures at lower temperatures than ethylene glycol. The strong intermolecular attractions for the two OH groups in ethylene glycol can be seen in the fact that the ethylene glycol curve is farthest to the right. So it takes much higher temperatures for ethylene glycol molecules to overcome their strong interactions and escape into the gas phase. Now vapor pressure also varies with temperature. Regardless of intermolecular force strength, higher temperatures increase vapor pressure for all the liquids. And this simply reflects the larger fraction of molecules that will have enough thermal energy to escape that liquid phase. Notice the dashed line here at 101 kilopascals. So this represents normal atmospheric pressure. In units of atmospheres, this would be 1 atm. In millimeters of mercury or tor, it would be 760. In general, when a substance boils, the vapor pressure of the liquid must equal atmospheric pressure. So in order to form the bubbles that characterize full-scale boiling, those bubbles have to have as much pressure from the vapor pressure vapor inside pushing out as the atmosphere has pushing in. So this is a really important relationship to remember. At the boiling point of any liquid, its vapor pressure is always equal to the atmospheric pressure. And when we're dealing with the normal boiling point, the atmospheric pressure is always assumed to be the pressure at sea level, which is considered to be 1 atm, 1 atmosphere, 760 millimeters of mercury, or 101 kilopascals. Now we know that, for example, water has a normal boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. And if we read up from 100 degrees to the vapor pressure curve of water, what we find is that at this temperature, water does it have a vapor pressure of exactly the atmospheric pressure of 101 kilopascals. 
for substances with weaker intermolecular attractions like ethyl ether, that normal boiling point is actually much lower. It reaches 760 kilopascals, or excuse me, 760 millimeters of mercury, or 101 kilopascals at 35 degrees Celsius. Ethyl alcohol reaches that vapor pressure at close to 80 degrees Celsius. So if the atmospheric pressure changes, the boiling point of the liquid can also change. For example, at higher elevations, atmospheric pressure can be significantly lower than 101 kilopascals. In those cases, then the vapor pressure of the liquid actually doesn't need to be as high for boiling to occur. If atmospheric pressure, for example, is 80 kilopascals, then vapor pressure will equal atmospheric pressure at a much lower temperature, say 93 degrees Celsius. So lower atmospheric pressures correspond to lower temperatures for boiling. And if you've ever noticed the special high altitude cooking directions on a recipe or a cooking mix, that's there to accommodate the lower boiling temperature of water and the longer cooking times that are generally necessary to accommodate this. Now we can actually calculate new boiling temperatures using the vapor pressure temperature relationships for any liquid. The relationships that are described by these curves on the graph can also be quantified in the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. So this is going to be the topic of the next PowerPoint narration.